opposite of neurocritical care. I know. Okay. But still, it's great. Right. Yeah. This when did you get here? Me? I've been here since Saturday. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. This is my sorry only first. I'm sorry I didn't run into you. Yeah. Actually, oh no, there, there was a faculty dinner. I guess you, you know, you know, they had they had the uh, old Mount Sinai. They had a reception. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. You didn't get. You didn't get. You didn't get on the mailing list because you're a nocturnist and a, you know, right, exactly. an affiliated unit. Right, exactly. Yeah, oh, it's too bad. Anyway, anyway, great seeing you. Anyway, great seeing you. Yeah, you too. All right, and we're gonna do this thing. Oh, good. I thought nobody was gonna come. Oh. No, no. <laughs> We'd all go out for breakfast. <laughs> anyway, all right. Good seeing you, and stay well.
you have to come sit and look pretty. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for joining us uh, so early on the last day of the meeting. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be moderating this session, uh, the Smackdown in San Antonio, debating heavyweight topics in 2018, chest lung cancer screening guidelines. Uh, my name is Nicole Tanner. I'm a pulmonologist at the Medical University of South Carolina and the R Ralph H. Johnson VA. Um, this is an audience response uh, session. Um, and so just to point you all to your cell phones, um, on the CHEST app, there's two separate ways to find this session. Uh, you can click on the button with the question mark for polling, um, or you can go and click on the schedule and search uh, by the time. And so I would encourage you to do that. We are going to have uh, pre and post questions here. Um, so let's just start here. Uh, and this is just to kind of get a sense of what's happening in the crowd. So in your current practice, how often do you use risk-based calculations to determine eligibility for lung cancer screening? A, almost never, B, a minority of the time, C, most of the time, or D, almost always? Hopefully you all have had a chance to pull up the app. Okay. So for the majority of, uh, oh, everybody's just getting in. We don't know when the polling ends. <laughs> All right, so it looks like uh, for the most part, it's either almost never or a minority of time that these calculators are being used. Um, and so I think that's it for this particular one. Um, and I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Rosen introduce our speaker. Hi, I'm Mark Rosen. So. I was asked to do this because I'm supposed to um, make everybody uh, excited, laughing, happy, and I told Gerard, I said, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, it's 7.30 in the morning on the last day. No, Mark, I want you to get in there. Let's get ready to rumble. And I'm going like, oh, man, can I have some more coffee? I said, is this going to be here? Where are the ropes? I was thinking about coming in with a white shirt and a bow tie and, and doing this, but um, I thought about it and I sort of uh, gave up on it. When Nicole just said, everybody get on your cell phones, it's like, well, I'm already on my cell phone. I'm checking my mail, I'm talking to my kids. So here we are, it's the heavyweight smackdown. Um, I will, somebody had coffee. Um, <laughs> I will, and, um, I, I, will, I didn't make nicknames for anybody. I am not going to divulge anybody's weight. Uh, hmm. Now that I'm thinking about it, what we should have had was you know, the face down beforehand and the trash talk where everybody's looking at each other like this. Um, but no, so are we ready? For, the first topic is going to be, are we ready for risk-based screening? Um, those of you who say they almost always do, what country do you work in? Um, or who hasn't read the, uh, the, the uh, description of risk-based um, screening? But we're going to hear all about that. The first speaker, and this is truly um, heavyweights. What I noticed also, I did a little bit of homework in advance, and I see everybody who's debating each other, we're all co-authors on the same guideline papers. <laughs> so, so this is entirely an artificial construct. Everybody agrees with everybody else, or the real smackdown would have been in the room where it happened um, during those guidelines. Um, so, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Mazzone, Cleveland Clinic, editor-to-be of the journal Chest. He has an advantage in that if he loses, then nobody else ever gets an article published in Chest. <laughs> okay, so um, Peter's going to take the pro on are we ready for risk-based screening. Thanks very much for the introduction and for the invitation. I appreciate everyone coming out early on the last day. I am the, by pro, I'm supporting what our guidelines have said. So our guidelines have said that we are not ready for a policy of risk-based screening. Uh, I'm debating Doug Ehrenberg from University of Michigan. Doug and I have been good friends for a long time, and I've respected uh, uh, Doug's knowledge in this area. Uh, but before debating him, I wanted to learn even more, so I knew how to prepare uh, for, for this debate. So I thought the best approach was to do a Google search for <laughs> Doug Ehrenberg picture and see what I could glean from the pictures that came up. There were 11 rows of pictures, 
And so I selected one picture from each row just, just to try to really get a clear idea of who Doug is. So this is his picture from the University of Michigan. On the second row, uh, this showed Doug, I suspect, in a triathlon, showing you know he's, he's fit, he's a fighter. Uh, I've got a lot to live up to here. On the third row was this picture. This is a picture of Doug Wood. Doug Wood's a thoracic surgeon who leads the NCCN guidelines. So I could only imagine the two of them have discussed this topic a little bit. And the fourth row was a picture <laughs> of President Trump. And the only thing I could imagine was maybe Doug got some debate advice from President Trump and he'd be standing over my shoulder for the rest of this <laughs> debate. At this point, I thought maybe this strategy wasn't working. Maybe this really isn't the best way to figure out who Doug is. But the fifth picture was this one. And anyone who's ever seen Doug talk knows he includes a slide about Star Trek in every one of his talks. Who's not going to come back from the away mission is his usually, usually po usual point. So I figured I better go through with the rest of these rows. So best I could interpret, turns out Doug grew up as a young Asian child. <laughs> his residency was chronicled in the popular sitcom Scrubs. His transient fame led to a brief affair with the Kardashians. <laughs> which ended tragically when the Kardashians knew that they couldn't compete with his love of Winnie the Pooh. This is true. Doug was so distraught that he went on to do what every man would like to do. He became a pirate. <laughs> and then in the final and the 11th row was this picture, and I decided I have absolutely no idea who I'm debating today. <laughs> but the topic we're debating stems around this question, recommendation number two from our guidelines, where we say that asymptomatic smokers and former smokers who don't meet age and smoking history-based eligibility criteria but have a high risk for developing lung cancer based on a risk calculator should not be routinely screened at this time. So I'm going to try and support this recommendation. And I'm gonna do it by just reminding us that screening is a balance of benefits and harms. And then I'm gonna highlight that improved accuracy does not equate to an improved balance of benefits and harms. Improved accuracy being clinical validation of a biomarker, improved balance of benefits and harms being clinical utility. And then I'm gonna end with just a few uh, risk calculator uncertainties. So first, we're all aware lung cancer screening is a balance of benefits and harms. The benefit is fewer people die of lung cancer, the harms are the results of performing the test or follow-up of results from the test. The difference between screening and diagnosis or treatment is only a very small fraction of everyone screened ever sees benefit. All are exposed to harm, and the people you're screening are healthy by definition. This is the balance of benefits to harms that was demonstrated in the National Lung Screening Trial. Three low dose, annual low-dose CT scans, age and smoking history-based criteria performed in capable settings. You had to screen 320 people to avert one lung cancer death, 125 of which would have had a lung nodule, aid a procedure for that nodule, one person would have been overdiagnosed and treated, no one would have died of the small radiation risk, and the, it would have been reasonable cost effectiveness. So how might selecting patients by different criteria, by risk calculators, potentially impact that balance of benefits to harms? This is another way to reflect that balance. Again, three fewer people out of 1,000 dying, 365 with a nodule, eight, uh, 25 have a biopsy, three a severe complication, and four were overdiagnosed and treated. But what if you selected a population where you're finding more nodules? What if you selected a population that was going to have more complications from evaluation or treatment of those nodules, more likely to be distraught by finding out they had a nodule, or were sicker, were more elderly, and leading to more death from causes other than lung cancer, then perhaps that balance would be tipped. So we're debating really, should we be using one of these risk calculators? And there are a few others. The one we talk about most often, the PLCOM 2012, Dr. Tamimagi's model, includes risk factors in addition to age and smoking history, things known to be associated with risk of lung cancer. 
Now, this has been uh, amazingly well developed and clinically validated. We know its accuracy compared to current risk uh, eligibility criteria. Compared to the USPSTF criteria, you can screen 9% fewer patients and find 12% more lung cancers. So if the only question was, can we find people at higher risk, risk calculators would be the way to go. If everyone with the same risk had the same balance of benefits and harms, then risk calculators would be the way to go. But the question we have to ask is, are there reasons why selecting people with risk calculators may give you a different balance of benefits to harms? So first question, does everybody benefit equally? Well, in the NLST, that wasn't the case. In fact, you could argue, though it wasn't powered to prove this, men didn't benefit, it was only women, and anyone diagnosed with a squamous cell cancer didn't benefit. So since everyone doesn't benefit equally, we have to ask the question, is there a reason that this clinically validated biomarker, this risk predictor, might not lead to clinical utility? So let's take one of the risk factors that's included in the most common risk model. Let's take COPD. We know that COPD patients are much more likely to have squamous cell than those without COPD, the, the histology that didn't benefit. We know that COPD patients were more likely to be found to have a lung nodule in the NLST. We know that COPD patients have a higher risk for complications from biopsies of lung nodules. We know that as your lung function declines, your risk for resection increases. We know that as your lung function declines, your five-year survival after a lobectomy for a stage one lung cancer decreases. We know that as your lung function declines, the rate of dying of causes other than lung cancer accelerates at a pace that exceeds the rate of dying from lung cancer. We know that the NLST population was remarkably healthy, survival much better than the same cohort in the general population. And it's perhaps for all of these reasons that if you looked at the highest tertile of risk from the Akron arm of the NLST, it actually was the category that was least likely to benefit from screening in the NLST. So for all of these reasons, I think it would be more proper for a clinically validated tool, these risk calculators, to be forced to prove clinical utility before we formed policy around those calculators. Now there are also some risk calculator uncertainties. How are we going to use them? This study compared nine models in two large populations, found only 20% of everybody selected was selected by all nine models. Now, only four of those models were really accurate and well calibrated, the ones we most commonly use and talk about. But even amongst them, there was over three million patient difference in who they would select at a fixed threshold and consensus on fewer than three quarters of all of the patients. In a uh, commentary to this article, Dr. Tamamagi, who made the models, had these quotes. He said, uh, we must convince policymakers to use these, uh, but then went on to say, we need to establish thresholds that define high risk and find optimal ways to implement risk models. Two comments that probably should come before convincing the policymakers. Also said that we have to overcome the perception that these models identify people who are too elderly or sick and that clinician judgment is gonna override this if a risk model is used. Uh, we're gonna turn people away essentially. His own work has shown that we actually do identify people who are older, have more comorbidities, and are much more likely to die of other causes by using risk calculators. And the only way to bring those numbers close would be if we eliminate the low risk group from the NLST. I'm fortunate to give a lot of these talks and never have I heard anyone have a strong appetite for eliminating people who have uh, already been told they're eligible for screening. And now that the Nelson trial results are positive, now that Nelson uh, was a trial that enrolled an even lower risk group, I think the appetite is, is gonna be um, uh, gone. He also said, we'll turn them away. I know in my own program, we always struggle. Too many people with severe COPD on oxygen. And, and I was uh, comforted that I'm not alone. 
This recent uh, report from Boston Medical Center showed that their population is very, very sick as well, much sicker than those in the NLST. This was a decision uh, analysis model and, and the author in the discussion said, what absolute risk threshold will we use? Um, my model didn't uh, include uh, anything about the clinical and molecular characteristics of tumors in patient survival. Uh, these models are ideally performed within data sets obtained from randomized studies and the decision analysis curve may vary by and be population dependent. In this cost effectiveness analysis, a sensitivity analysis found that if you had a lower utility for health quality in those who were sicker, the low uh, end of the risk categories were actually more cost effective and that their model doesn't account for reductions in quality of life due to the greater burden of non-lung disease in higher risk patients and doesn't account for different tumor types, grades, and stages. So despite all of those problems, our guidelines went on to say, look, we're saying there's a policy for a cohort. If you as an individual see a high-risk person who doesn't meet criteria and you find they're healthy, they're young enough, you know that they're, they're going to benefit more than be harmed, then you can still choose to, to screen them. But we didn't think it was time for a policy uh, to shift towards using these risk calculators. So in summary, I hope uh, I gave you a better understanding of, of the next speaker. I hope uh, that you understand the balance of benefits and harms a little bit and how our choice of who we screen can affect that balance. I hope that I've shown that clinical validation of these risk calculators does not yet equate to clinical utility and highlighted some of the risk calculator uncertainties that we need to overcome. Uh, thanks very much for your time. All right, and the, um, the opponent, uh, Dr. Doug Ehrenberg, who you've already seen, I do have one comment based on that slide you showed of all the pictures, um, and especially talking about the policymakers and convincing them, what do you think the likelihood is of convincing the policymakers to adopt a guideline that benefits women and not men? I believe that the Supreme Court of the United States would strike that one down. Um, so, Dr. Arenberg is going to take the, um, the pro side of uh, the risk-based screening. I think Peter's efforts to throw me off by telling my life story have failed, I hope. Uh, so, I know we're supposed to have disclosure slides and I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, but you know, the full disclosure is that I do consider Peter a friend, but I came here to bring you down. So. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Um, so I think you know, Peter did a good job of identifying that you know, the goal of lung cancer screening is to create the greatest benefit as measured by a reduction in disease-specific mortality while minimizing screening harm. And I think if we walk, go out in the street right now and grab the first 10 or 15 people we find who aren't in medicine, which would be hard to do at this meeting, but find some non-physicians, ask them what are the benefits of cancer screening, you might get the right answer, which is really screening is rooting for our patients to die from someone else's disease. That's really, I, I make my patients, when they come to talk to me about screening, I make them articulate that screening is really about dying from something else. Life is 100% fatal. Um, identifying harm outside of a clinical trial can be difficult, but I think our job as the pulmonologist is to be the stewards of harm reduction when it comes to screening uh, patients. Um, Identifying more cancers will always come at a cost of more false positives, more overdiagnosis, and potentially conflict with competing causes of mortality. So our job is to identify that area where balance is critical. And I guess my biggest argument is that being able to measure risk makes that job a little bit easier. Uh, so is there evidence that risk-based screening improves the balance of risks and benefits? Well, no. I mean, Peter just showed you there is no prospective evidence, and I'm going to look at what retrospective evidence there is, and I'll have you judge the quality of that evidence at the end. Um, so we'll start with a paper that was published a few years after the NLST where they looked at the Kowalczyk model, uh, uh, or they looked at the model of, of identifying risk divided by risk quintile. So from this uh, graph here, which shows the risk quintiles from lowest on the left to highest on the right, what you see is that there may actually be some benefit from identifying low risk, which is there's a suggestion here, which is not a statistically significant observation, it's a post hoc observation, but 
the mortality ratio, that is the risk of dying in a screened group versus a non-screened group, really wasn't that different if you just look at it divided by risk quintile. So perhaps being able to identify people who in spite of their eligibility for screening are truly at low risk and then engage in a shared decision-making visit with them about that relative risk of dying from lung cancer and the risks of screening, that might be a utility that we uh, should take advantage of. So keep that picture in mind. And from the same paper, this study shows the quintiles from lowest risk on the left to highest risk on the right, separated by the lung cancer deaths prevented by low-dose CT. And as you see, the uh, bottom left number there is zero, is that you're really getting quite close to not preventing that many lung cancer deaths because the risk of death, the absolute risk of death in that lowest quintile is actually quite low. And of course, as you go from lower to higher, the number of deaths that you're preventing goes up. This is the uh, way to look at it from my perspective. And <clears throat> what about the number of lung cancer deaths that you prevent? If you screen a population of patients and you discover somehow magically with your crystal ball that you've prevented people from dying from lung cancer, where are most of those prevented deaths coming from? Most of them are coming from the highest risk quintiles. And in this graph, from the same paper, the authors confused us, threw us a curveball by putting the highest risks on the left here. So the highest three quintiles of risk accounted for almost 90% of the prevented mortality in the NLST. So being able to identify those who are at highest risk, again, these are healthy people, and I don't think we can underestimate. These are clinical trial participants. But we are better at identifying those who are at greatest risk or better at screening those who are at greatest risk if our goal is to prevent them from dying from that disease. Disease-specific mortality is the ultimate measure of the effectiveness of a screening program. <clears throat> what about false positives? So we don't really have a way of measuring harm in terms of biopsy bad outcomes, pneumothoraces, bleeding. We don't have a great way of doing that, but we do have a surrogate. That is, you're more likely to have one of these bad things happen to you if you have a false positive. We're willing to have a pneumothorax if we have lung cancer to get a diagnosis of it. We don't want to, but I think most people would trade that off. But if you have a granuloma, we don't want to put somebody through a surgery uh, or through an unnecessary biopsy if they have a granuloma. Well, the relative distribution of harms, the relative distribution of false positives was pretty even from one quintile to the next. What you see in this cumulative graph from left to right of the number of false positives is about 20, 40, 60, 80 percent. That is, the false positives as a surrogate for harm were relatively evenly distributed. Now, what's the risk of a biopsy in that far left bar versus in that right bar? I think you have to be very, very careful about that. But the risk of having a false positive, the proportional risk of having a false positive, was not different across those groups. And if you look at the graph on the right, it's the number of false positives per prevented lung cancer death. They're much higher in the low risk population, which is identified over here in that last bar. This is the lowest risk uh, quintile when you add that in. So the risk benefit ratio is not equally distributed across the population of the US PSTF target uh, uh, population. And so identifying risk at both high and low ends improves the balance of harms and benefits as long as we aren't identifying people who have high comorbid disease. And I think Peter made a good job of, uh, of, of, of putting that point across, and I will stipulate that that is correct. But I'm also going to point out in his own words, I will use his own words against him, aha, yes I will, <laughs> why this is important. So this is a paper uh, that a lot of us may remember. Um, this was, <clears throat> if you look at the dotted line, the dotted line is only above the solid line when you get above a risk. And so the dotted line is the mortality benefit uh, of lung cancer screening. And what you see is that the mortality from a lung cancer was only less in the, in the screen group than in the control group once you got above a certain level of risk. That is, below that level of risk, the mortality benefit's pretty questionable. And this is a post hoc analysis of two cohorts, the PLCO and NLST cohorts, with the risk model applied to it. And what they identified was that at a risk of about 1.5%, the mortality in the screen group, which is this red line here at the bottom, is always lower than in the control group. So again, an, a signal, if you will, that we are more efficient in preventing mortality when we identify those who are at highest risk when we use our screening tool. Another way to look at this is look at the number needed to screen. So at the very low risk group, if you divide this into three uh, 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 tertiles, 
there was no screening benefit at all. In the middle risk group, you have a screening in intervention that looks a little bit like mammography for women age 50 to 60. About 1,000 needed to screen to save one life. And as you get into that higher risk group, the number needed to screen falls precipitously. And again, identifying risk allows us to uh, target our intervention to those with the greatest potential to benefit from it. So, Peter, do you recognize this? I sort of paraphrased it, but I think, I think you wrote this, if I recall correctly. So let's, let's just look at the words here. For those who do not meet screening criteria but are deemed to be at risk based on clinical risk prediction calculators, we suggest that low-dose CT screening should not be routinely performed. Now, I love our ACCP guidelines because we do have a lot of debate. And when there's a lot of debate, you'll see there's generally more remarks underneath the guidelines. So if you go back and look at all the least controversial recommendations, there are no remarks. There's a lot of remarks underneath this. So I think we should pay attention to what the authors told us. Who's the author again? Um, raise your hand if you help. Peter Mazzone, ladies and gentlemen. Now, risk prediction calculators may be more efficient at identifying individuals at risk. I think Peter would agree with that. But the variables included in the risk models are also risk factors for bad outcomes from what we do to people with lung nodules. I will also acknowledge that. But below that, you'll see there are individuals at high risk for lung cancer using a risk model who are healthy enough to benefit from lung cancer screening. And screening could be considered in these individuals. I think the door just creaked open a little bit there, Peter, maybe, I don't know. Below, uh, uh, and, and by the way, does that number in the next paragraph, does it look familiar? A risk threshold of 1.51% over six years on the risk calculator is an example. Where'd that number come from? I think he's used, he chose the same paper that I just looked at. But the last remark, which I totally agree with, is that additional lung cancer screening trials that include patients who have a high risk are needed. So let's take a look. I borrowed this slide from Haval Balata, who's one of the principal investigators on the Manchester Lung Cancer Screening Trial. And I forgot to take his animations out of it, but I did highlight this. These are the people that they enrolled in this particular clinical trial, which is currently ongoing in, in Manchester, which is the northwest of England. Uh, very, very uh, uh, high proportion of patients who are poor, uh, with a lot of what they call deprivation, and there are deprivation indices, and they targeted people at the highest uh, uh, risk in their group by, by basically arriving in parking lots with these CT scans on a, on a semi-trailer. But look at the numbers that they chose. The PLCO incorporated, uh, and only those with a PLCO risk over 1.51%. So this number does come up a lot. And I think it comes up a lot because people who look at lung cancer screening from a public health perspective have seen this data and find it very intriguing. And then finally, there is <clears throat> another trial currently ongoing. Steve Lamb is the PI out in British uh, Columbia. And if you look at the top left box there, they too chose a PLCO modified 2012 six-year risk score of 1.51%. So people who think about screening from a public health perspective are already beginning to incorporate this into their clinical trials. And so I think we will get information. We, want, we aren't going to be able to translate this definitively into a mortality benefit. But I think what we will be able to do is see surrogates that signal the risk-benefit ratio is actually having improved by identifying people at high risk. So going back to the current ACCP guidelines that risk prediction calculators may be more efficient at identifying individuals at high risk, the variables included in these models do identify people who are at risk from what we do to them as a result of finding an abnormality on screening. This is true. But let's keep in mind the USPSTF actually already knew this. And, and what we forget, you know, I've, I've said this before, if we want to do great things, we have to do the ordinary things extraordinarily well. We forget the fine print in the USPSTF guidelines, which is just the second sentence. Screening should be discontinued once a person hasn't smoked for 15 years or develops a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative surgery. We forget this. I know in my lung cancer screening program, where we run a very decentralized program, I routinely see people being screened with severe comorbid illness. And this is what I'm trying to put the brakes on in our program because we don't see everyone in a centralized fashion because we screen people over seven different counties in Southeast Michigan. And I know that there are people in this room and on this table who have had, who've really put a lot of effort into making sure that those people who are being screened are the proper population. I think we as a profession have to do better at this than, than I currently see happening in my own screening program. 
I'll take one last thing, which is that the USPSTF guidelines were interpreted by CMS to include a requirement for shared decision making. Okay, and you can't do shared decision making well unless you give the patient all the relevant information. And I would argue that one of the relevant pieces of information is someone's actual individualized risk. This was a paper published by one of my colleagues from the University of Michigan where they modeled patient preferences. And his, his point is that risk only matters insofar as the patient can interpret it. You have people who are generally anti-screening and generally don't want to have anything done. They're minimizers. We call them maybe the grumpier side. And then you have people that want everything done whatsoever. And eliciting patient preferences is part of shared decision making. So what Tanner Caverly and his colleagues did was they asked, how do you incorporate this into our interpretation of risk? And so they applied what are called disutilities. Are there any health uh, care outcomes researchers in here? I'm not a healthcare outcomes researcher, but I, I did read up enough to understand that a disutility is basically how much you dislike something. And if you had a disutility and you wanted to apply it to a model that calculates quality adjusted life years, it simply reduces your quality of life by a certain amount related to how much you dislike what's happening to you. So they did this in a very evidence-based way and applied disutilities for people who really didn't like screening and applied favorable utilities for people who really wanted screening. And what you see here are three graphs. The top graph is the people who were favorably predisposed towards screening and its outcomes. The middle graph, you have the base case preferences. And the bottom graph, you have the grumpier folks, people who say, I don't want you to do anything to me. And what they asked was when they adjusted quality adjusted life years by these preferences, where was the quality adjusted life year benefit no longer present? And what they found was that the extremes of screening preferences on the far left, below a risk of about 1.98%, and on the far right, a very, very high risk, was that quality adjusted life years were never favorable in the screening setting. But in the middle, that large group in the middle, who had sort of intermediate preferences, even if you were anti-screening, your quality adjusted life year benefit was still present. In other words, even adjusting for people who didn't like going through these processes, in general, their quality adjusted life year benefit was present with screening. So you can't do this without being able to assess one's absolute risk over a time horizon that the patient can uh, interpret. And this is a fairly fancy way of saying, if you include utilities and disutilities in your screening models, that the number needed to screen actually goes up below that, that level and, 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 and above the level of 7.8%, you can see on the right where that arrow ends, is that your quality adjusted life years in, uh, it never really come out in favor of screening. So assessing both the patient's preferences for screening, their absolute risk for screening. Now, I've already said we aren't doing this simple things well. This is what I think we should be reaching for as a profession, and I don't think we're there yet. Being able to assess people's risks and their preferences. So I think screening should be encouraged in the appropriate population, encouraged. High risk, minimal comorbidity, that I think is our target population. It's where the most efficient, the most cost efficient uh, 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 screening occurs. Rather than say, just saying those at the highest risk for cancer, I would say that we should encourage screening in those whose risk of death from lung cancer is expected to be higher than that from competing causes of mortality. How good are we at identifying competing causes of mortality? Probably not very good. I think we need to be better at that. This cannot be achieved, though, without first being able to measure risk. And so I think if Peter and I were standing here, we'd probably say we agree a lot more on some of this stuff than we don't. But he's right. I always include my Star Trek slide in every lung cancer screening talk I give. Poor Ensign Ricky is not coming back from whatever mission he is here. <laughs> but if we could just identify those Ensign Rickies for lung cancer, I think we'd be better off. Well, thank you for that. We are going to do a quick um, post-debate uh, question, so please bring out your cell phones. Okay, he told me to do that. Okay, post-debate question. What tools would be necessary for you to consider moving forward with risk-based screening? A, a randomized trial. B, easily accessible risk prediction calculators. C, for the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force and CMS to endorse this. D, A, B, and C, or E, after this debate, I don't need anything new, and we'll start with this approach. Hmm. That doesn't look right. Let's try that again. Here we go.
Well, I don't know if it says who won the debate there. I think it does. <laughs> okay, well done. Um, we are just, in the interest of time, going to move on to the next set of debates, and we do have some pre and post questions for the uh, next group. So there's two pre questions, if you would. Uh, in your current practice, how often are you assessing patients for comorbidities prior to offering lung screening? Almost never, a minority of the time, most of the time, or almost always. How often are you assessing patients for comorbidities before you offer them screening? Okay, it's a split 50% most of the time and almost, well, I guess the majority of people are trying to do it. All right, next pre-debate question and the last before we start. Is it reasonable to screen patients for lung cancer if surgery is not an option? A, never, B, sometimes, C, always. No one wants to take either end, okay. All right, great, thanks. You wanna introduce the next? Okay, well, before I introduce the next speaker, my, my mission here is to be, um, a, as it was hinted, is I'm supposed to be an obnoxious, sarcastic uh, New Yorker <laughs> who is, um, you know, has to say something bad about each of the uh, speakers. So I didn't get a chance with you, Doug. Um, Dr. Arenberg started off saying, when he tells his patients, and when he sees a patient in his lung cancer screening program, the first thing he says is, Aunt Betty, you're gonna die. And now let me tell you, my role is to keep you from getting hit by a truck on your way out of the, uh, the office. <laughs> so um, it is, uh, I, I'm sure this does uh, great for his patient satisfaction scores. <laughs> like, Jesus, Dr. Ehrenberg told me he's gonna die. <laughs> um, and it, um, I, I regret that uh, this just in, um, his patient satisfaction scores have uh, warranted a uh, prompt dismissal from the staff of University of Michigan. Um, so, we're going to the next, um, the, the next debate. Um, are we ready to screen people with multiple comorbidities? Now, this is truly a battle of the giants. We've got two guys, first of all, they're both wearing ties. Um, we have the North versus the South. We have, most of all, a surgeon versus a not surgeon. Although Dr. Silvestri in interventional radiology has tipped his hand that he really wanted to be a surgeon, but he wasn't, I don't know, smart enough? So, so the first speaker um, will be um, Dr. Frank Detterback, who just said, uh, I'm just Frank from New Haven. Um, uh, thoracic surgeon extraordinaire who will take the pro on uh, getting ready to screen lung cancer uh, patients, for, for lung cancer in patients with comorbidities. All right, well, that's a... Uh pleasure to be here. So uh, start with disclosures. So I have no uh, financial disclosures and uh, you know I'm really not a guy to pick a lot of fights. I'm uh, <laughs> much more a guy to find the, the even ground. And I have to say that I really consider Gerard as a friend. <laughs> you know but sometimes you know friends challenge you to do a duel you just got to stand your ground and even though I'm from you know Connecticut which is the home of uh, you know Winchester Rifle Company and Colt <laughs> Firearms I don't have any concealed weapons you know they uh, they, they took them <laughs> they took them from me when I was trying to board the airplane and you know I mean, I like debating Gerard, but, you know, he always gets beat up in the process, and, you know, I always feel sorry for him, but, you know, Gerard, because you're my friend, I have the ambulance waiting for you outside. <laughs> so, uh, I think we're going to get started here. Gerard, you ready? Start your... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Gerard. <laughs> Bring it, Gerard. So this is how Gerard fights cancer. He's got a piddly little needle on a floppy little scope. This is how I go about fighting cancer. <laughs> Are you sure you're ready, Gerard? So, you know, should we screen patients with comorbidities? Well, we already are, and we always have. 
So I think I could probably just stop right there. So this is the uh, NLST. This is the uh, Akron part of the NLST, and all of those patients had spirometry, and this was, uh, you know, kind of breaking it down for all participants, and so 34% of those had COPD. See that here in this pie chart. Um, you know, in addition, when you look at the patients that had lung cancer in the, the you know, Akron part, a greater proportion of those, 52% of those, had COPD. So a signal that, you know, the COPD patients are perhaps the ones that uh, we need to pay more attention to. This was the uh, same study, and uh, it suggested that, uh, let's see if I can get this pointer working here. Okay, you know, so it, uh, <clears throat> it suggested that uh, in the uh, COPD patients, <clears throat> you know, there was a greater benefit to, uh, uh, to CT uh, scanning. Uh, the, there were, you know, less cancers overall, whereas in the uh, non-COPD patients, there were a lot of overdiagnosed cancers. And if you look at the, the black bars or the stage three and stage four cancers, uh, there were less of those. Uh, there was a greater reduction in the patients with COPD, so suggesting that, uh, you know, we really need to pay careful attention to this. This was a follow-up study of the same, uh, you know, NL NLST Akron uh, cohort mm -hmm. uh, looking at various categories of COPD, suggesting that, you know, those patients that have comorbidities have COPD at least that, uh, you know, they have a greater uh, risk of lung cancer. <clears throat> so that's a greater risk. We talked earlier about, you know, does that translate to a greater benefit? Well, this is the Danish randomized uh, screening trial. Um, it was underpowered, only had 4,000 patients, so it didn't show a mortality difference overall. Um, but it did suggest that those patients that have COPD and those patients that smoke more cigarettes are the ones that have the higher risk of lung cancer, and there was a suggestion that, uh, you know, they are the ones that have a, a benefit from, uh, uh, from screening, um, <clears throat> at least a, a benefit in terms of fewer stage 3, 4 patients. So, you know, often people make this statement, you know, if you're not going to treat, there can be no benefit to screening. And, you know, that's sort of a duh statement. I mean, that's just an entry-level statement. I think uh, that doesn't really uh, uh, hit the mark very well. And uh, it's certainly true if you're not going to treat. But uh, I think that, you know, you really ought to have to kind of go beyond that and use your clinical judgment. And I think the questions are, is the comorbidity that you're talking about, you know, really life limiting? You know, how much does it limit biopsy options? How much does it affect that? Um, how much does it compromise treatment options? Uh, and is the either the life expectancy or the treatment effectiveness, um, you know, does that really obviate the benefits from screening? So I'm going to start out a little bit by talking about surgery in patients with uh, compromised lung function. But, you know, first, you know, this is uh, VATS. This is <coughs> large database uh, uh, studies, uh, you know, some just large databases, some propensity matched or adjusted. This is really all of the data I could get from large databases. And you can see that operative mortality on the VATS side is lower than it is on the open side. And, same is true for complications, length of stay, um, and outcomes are really the same. They're lower on the upper part, uh, um, but, you know, where you've done propensity matching, where the green bars are, they're equal. So uh, that clearly gives you less uh, complications. If we move that into compromised patients, um, this is a... Uh, uh, SDS database uh, analysis looking at uh, different uh, categories of FEV1 and you can see that you know in the black columns there that the as you get down to lower FEV1 uh, the benefit of that seems to get greater and greater and what you sort of see from open thoracotomy that the um, 
complications go up that, you know, that is really not so much true for VATS. This is a uh, different study, different database, uh, showing you basically similar results. Uh, you know, the VATS cohort on one side and the Thor economy cohort on the other side, but if you compare um, VATS versus Thor economy, uh, you know, clearly there are lower complications uh, by risk categories of FEV1 or DLCO by VATS, so uh, it makes a big difference. Another study looking at the S database, lobectomies, uh, again looking at uh, either uh, mortality or complications, but showing that the, uh, the VATS is always a lot lower than the Thor economy, particularly, it's not much of a difference in the high cohorts, but when you get down to the compromised patients, it's pretty low. A uh, bunch of series looking at VATS versus open, but if you look at the rate of mortality, compromised patients, here's the definition of compromise, compromised patients, you know, pretty acceptable complications, you know, not that bad. I mean, there certainly are some. Um, and better than VAT. So I think if you're talking, uh, than open. So better, if you're talking about uh, uh, VAT surgery, I think you have to keep that in mind as to uh, how bad is this really in compromised patients. <laughs> now, you know, there's also another option, which is SBRT, and there's really essentially no mortality from SBRT and very little uh, complications. Uh, there's some quality of life studies. I just throw this one up here. Uh, you know, also shows you that there's essentially no downside to quality of life if you've been treated with SBRT. Maybe a little uh, drop off in DLCO over time. I think that's probably due to just progression of underlying disease. Um, however, I think that if you compare lobectomy to SBRT, this is a comparison here, not in compromised patients, but the uh, best way we could do this was to take only the best patients that had absolutely no comorbidities, were getting full dose SBRT or lobectomy, so sort of optimal treatment, and this was a propensity match study that matched for, you know, every, uh, pretty much every known uh, confounding factor. Uh, and suggested that there was actually a, a much bigger difference than what I would suspect. And uh, I think this is probably, a, it's a non-randomized comparison, but probably uh, uh, only minimally uh, confounded. What about older patients? So this is a uh, study from uh, Gerard, uh, Gerard's group, and Nicole uh, published this. Uh, this is looking at the uh, CR Medicare cohort. Um, and they were defined to be kind of similar to NLST, and uh, if you look down at the bottom for short-term outcomes here, uh, in the NLST versus in this older population, but you know, similar patients, there was no evidence of any you know, difference in uh, uh, operative mortality here um, for stage one lung cancer patients, although there was somewhat of a difference in uh, survival for the older cohort. <clears throat> and this is the uh, survival curve uh, uh, from that study. So uh, NLST was uh, perhaps uh, uh, healthier and a little bit younger, uh, old, uh, excuse me, a little bit younger cohort. Uh, the SEER cohort that uh, kind of matched by being NLST uh, eligible uh, had slightly worse survival, and those that were ineligible with uh, Charleston comorbidity scores uh, did not do as well. Um, you know, the scale here is a 1 to 100 scale. These are patients with lung cancer, so uh, survival up here for the NLST was, you know, in the 75% range. Uh, here at five years or in the 50% range. Again, these are patients with lung cancer. Uh, so 50%, well, that's maybe not ideal, but uh, uh, it certainly could be worse. Uh, you've seen this slide uh, earlier. Um, and so this is now not patients with lung cancer, but looking at all patients. And uh, the NLST cohort was perhaps a little bit uh, better. Uh, these cohorts uh, down below are from a uh, health and retirement survey. Um, so maybe those are a little bit lower. On the other hand, look at the scale here. So, you know, these people, 90% of them are alive five years later. So I would say, uh, you know, 
and if you look at their life expectancy, 21 years versus 19 years, um, you know, is that really comorbidity where you would say, boy, there's no point in screening them? Um, I think we have to kind of question that a bit. Um, and so it may be true that if you have really severe uh, comorbidities that at some point your risks uh, of harms uh, goes up and the benefit of screening goes down, um, but there's probably quite a few patients in the middle uh, that uh, you know, have comorbidities and yet uh, may actually benefit more. Um, so I think that uh, we can't really take uh, comorbidities out of it. So this is a recommendation from the guidelines. So uh, for individuals with comorbidities that adversely influence their ability to tolerate an evaluation or treatment uh, or substantially limit their life expectancy, we recommend that screening should not be performed. However, there is a <coughs> remark. This is the last slide. Yeah. Um, you know, that uh, <clears throat> may be severe, but, uh, you know, there may be other individuals, I think, where uh, uh, your judgment is that it's not all that bad. Um, so I think if you're not going to treat, obviously there's no benefit, but I think you need to use your clinical judgment. We don't have quite the tools that we want for this, but in the real world, you're confronted with us every day, and I think we have to think about it carefully, uh, how life-limiting is it really? How much is it really going to affect your treatment options? Uh, and I think we have to make judgment calls. So I'll just leave it at this. Uh, you know, we certainly do screen. I think it's a matter of judgment. And Gerard, I'm sorry, but, you know, you've just lost. <laughs> Just remember, Texas is a concealed carry state. And you can't pick up your gun at the Target store. No pun intended. Okay. Okay. I don't have any disclosures related to this talk. For individuals with comorbidities ad that adversely affect uh, their ability to tolerate the evaluation of screen detected findings, we recommend that low dose CT should not be performed. Peter Mazzone was lead author in the footnote. Frank was the senior author on this guideline. So I just want to point out that whenever we're talking about this, Frank showed data from NLST, but this population was completely different. They were younger, they were better educated, which means they had better access to health care. Most of them were treated in NCI-designated cancer centers. The 8 million Americans that are going to be screened out there are older. Uh, they're more likely to be current smokers, which means they're more likely to have more comorbidities and such. So I, I think that we have to understand that whatever data we take from here is not necessarily generalizable to there. And everyone's shown this slide. Um, Frank likes to talk about it cutting off at 90, but it, NLST, it, the, the point of the slide is to show you that the NLST survivorship was fantastic. Again, arguing that the NLST had patients who were really quite healthy, uh, and what we're going to be looking at for screening is here and here, this Medicare eligible population. So uh, you've seen this slide before, perioperative mortality, as FEV1 goes down, such, so does uh, mortality in the 30-day mortality, Frank's fond of that, and the five-year survivorship also goes down. Same with diffusion capacity. Now, I, I want you to uh, look here at this 6.5%, because I'm going to show you this number again. Frank neglected to put that in when he showed the slide from the Tannerin uh, study. So Frank, pay attention. Left jab. The 8 million or so Americans eligible for screening are already different than NLST participants. Right to the gut. Frank, they are older, have more comorbidities, and are likely to have competing causes of death. Kidney shot. I know that's illegal, but it's only a warning. Frank, COPD is bad and a competing cause of death. For your edification as a surgeon, COPD is code for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It occurs in smokers, Frank. Just want to make sure you understood that. This is me, Muhammad Ali. Before George Foreman was selling grills, he was getting his butt kicked by Muhammad Ali, and that's Frank. Okay, so 
Frank, this is the best you can hope for in terms of complications because this is out of NLST and it's the best you can hope for, which is that you'll have complications in seven out of every 100 screened patients. Biopsies, 3.1 per thousand, and those with cancer, that's fine, I'll take that risk, 4.1 per 10,000 in those with benign nodules. Frank, I know you don't like to talk about that, but six of 10,000 patients died within 60 days of having a screening done. Okay? Now you want to do this not in very healthy NLST patients, but you want to do it in patients with multiple comorbidities, Frank. Um, and it's estimated that we have a bunch of overdiagnosed cancers. It'd be really ashamed to do that in someone with comorbid disease um, if, if we could avoid it. And again, I think you've seen this slide, but what I'll tell you is in patients with COP, you're much more likely to bleed, you're much more likely to get a pneumothorax, and you're much more likely to have a chest tube in patients with COPD. And how about, Frank likes to put up statistics from single site studies of, of surgeons who are high volume surgeons in the STS database, but what he fails to talk about is that the proportion of patients who undergo surgery for benign disease was 22%, and this is from screening studies, this is 17 screening studies, but that range ranged from 10% to almost 40%. I'm not okay with surgery for benign disease in anyone, but I'm really not okay with it in patients who have multiple comorbidities because that's not a good idea. The absolute rate of surgeries for benign disease in the CT studies was 4.5 per thousand screened. CT screening is associated with a higher likelihood of surgery for benign disease. I guess that's okay if you have a healthy NLST population, but it's not okay for people who have comorbid disease. And Frank likes to point out the single site studies, one of which was the NLST, which had the lowest mortality, turned out to be about 1.5%, because he likes to talk about VATS as being better. But what Frank failed to tell you, Frank failed to tell you is that in Medicare databases, 70% or so of the surgeries are open thoracotomies. It's only in Frank's center and the other high volume centers where it's VATS. So Frank pushed you towards the VATS, which I do think is better and has a low mortality, but that's not where most of the people are getting their surgery. Most of the people, if you look at this 512,000 database, 4.8% mortality for a lobectomy, not 1%, 5.2% in 729 hospitals. 76% of those patients had comorbidities. 21% of these had, uh, had comorbidities. So it's likely that what Frank is telling you about lung cancer surgery and mortality is in fact not true. So Frank, pay attention. Uppercut, even in the best case scenario, there are procedures performed for a benign disease. Right cross, those procedures take on an increased risk for patients with COPD and other comorbidities. Shot to the groin and I'm willing to take the one point deduction on the scorecard, surgery can actually kill people, Frank, and they are most likely to die if they have comorbid disease. This is Foreman going down, and at that time, just for people who don't know their history of boxing, Foreman was a vicious boxer who could not be beaten and just crushed people, and Muhammad Ali, who was really more towards the end of his career than the beginning, was knocking him out using the rope-a-dope tactic where he let himself get beaten for a few rounds just by hiding, and then he came out and kicked his you-know-what. So this is, uh, this is work, excuse me. This is work that uh, uh, Robert Young has done, and, and we've been working with him, Nicole and I, and it's been submitted and is under review right now. This is mortality per thousand uh, persons with lung cancer deaths relative to other disease-specific deaths. And this is taken from the Akron data where we could look at comorbidities. And if you notice here, as you go up in your goal criteria, Frank tried to misquote this, uh, this work, you are much more likely to die of a respiratory death than other cancer deaths or other deaths in general. So here you see we have healthy smokers and you can see the number of lung cancer deaths. Respiratory deaths are actually quite low. So screening would really benefit this group. Um, here you see that it really benefits this group and yet here you start to see a little creep up in respiratory deaths. But once you get to this heavy comorbidity group, lung cancer deaths are being replaced by or competing causes of death here, both here and cardiovascular disease. And this is, uh, this is you know, what really um, Robert Young is trying to say here. And if you look, oh, oh, Frank, he hate to show this. This has really bothered people. This is taken out of the NLST. And in Frank, I don't know what happened here, but as patients had a worsening COPD, their surgery rate actually went down. So what happened to that group, Frank? 
They probably got treated with something else that wasn't surgery. And let's look at their outcomes, Frank. This is from the data from our lab, and uh, Frank's already started to look at this data, but he again misquoted it because he left out one column. In the SEER NLST group, he is absolutely right. If we keep people NLST eligible, NLST eligible, if we find those people, we're much more likely to have a benefit from screening and a lower 30, 60, and 90-day mortality. By the way, Frank quotes all these mortality data, as do other surgeons, at 30-day mortality. We all know a surgeon can keep someone alive for 30 days. Then they transfer from us, traits pegged, to put in a long-term care facility. And I don't think their family members care whether they die at 31 days or three months in. So Frank, this is from the NLST ineligible group. These are people with two or plus mo more comorbidities, and 6% are dead at 90 days. 6%, 90 days after they're screened, 6% could be dead if we screen them with this. They, they might have actually survived a whole bunch of time and maybe died of their competing cause of death, but they wouldn't have died in 90 days, and their five-year survivorship is significantly lower. And Frank did show you these survival curves. Again, he likes to leave information out. Here's the information that you want to see, which is the people in the NLST group that received radiation because they couldn't be operated on, their outcome is way down here, around less than 25%, Frank. That's less than 25%, even though you bragged about, uh, well, you actually bragged and then cut on SBRT. That was kind of clever, I must admit, <laughs> because no surgeon's allowed to say that SBRT is good. Um, then, Frank, if you look at uh, people in the SEER uh, ineligible group who got these other radiation treatments or other treatments, their survivorship is very bad, Frank. So, Frank, I know you were punch drunk by now, but pay attention. 6% of patients with comorbidities are dead at three months. Less than half are alive at five years, and only 25% if you had a non-surgical treatment. Left cross and right overhand. Gold three and four patients are more likely to die of respiratory conditions than lung cancer. Knockout punch, they are less likely to undergo surgery, this is what kills them, um, for a screen detected cancer. So Frank, <laughs> there you are on the floor. Um, Frank. We also had this document which I urge everyone to read, and Frank and I are so loving, and we're actually right next to each other in this document, um, because we do actually love each other a great deal. And in that document, you'll find this, the complex interplay between baseline risk of developing lung cancer treatment-related harms and competing causes of death substantially, substantially um, affects the balance of harms and benefits. He showed the slide, but he wanted to stay on this end, and I agree, because these are the gold one-twos, Frank. He didn't want to talk about this end, which are the gold three-fours. He just didn't. So, NLST was performed in a really healthy population, and we talk about this all the time. How do you translate that? Why, how do you give drugs for patients with hypertension? Well, you have to go back to the studies and apply those drugs to the studies that they were that they were put in. Competing cause of death is an important concept. It does require finding balance, and I don't mean to say that we shouldn't screen some people with comorbidities. I think we have to define that sweet spot. And until we better understand these nuances, we should stick to the screening patients that are as close to patients enrolled in NLST as we can. And Doug Arenberg pointed this out, and I'll close here. Uh, Doug Arenberg pointed this out, that we are being inundated with people who are really too sick to be screened, and it is one of the most difficult things we have. This is actually, um, one, uh, just historically, the mo it was voted the most famous picture ever taken of a boxing match, and you can see me on this side and Frank over here. And I thank you for your kind attention. Before we vote, just because Gerard declared victory, it is not up to him, it is up to the judges. Um, to right. decide. so if you have a few seconds to vote, and then I know you all have other sessions to get to. Oh, hang on, let's try this. Mm, sorry. And Frank was wearing his metal cup, so the, uh, the shot to the <laughs> groin was of no uh, value. All right. Just look. Okay, so, um, so let's get through this. All right, uh, one more time. Okay, post-debate question. Following this debate, are you more likely or less likely to screen patients with multiple comorbidities? Is it A, I am more likely, B, I am less likely, C, neither of the speakers has changed my opinion on the topic, I want more research? Well, 
Well, there you have it. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your attendance. Stay tuned for the rematch at Chess 2019 in New Orleans. <laughs> seeing you.